Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. This episode is sponsored by 78 Sports. If you're a baseball coach and you're not familiar with 78 Sports, then you need to be. The guys at 78 Sports are a full design, supply, and installation team that does it all for baseball coaches and facilities. Whether you're looking to get new hitting mats, replace some L screens, or put up a new batting cage, or even design a brand new indoor facility, the 78 Sports team has you covered for it all. As an exclusive offer for our podcast listeners, 78 Sports is offering special pricing on your order when you mention Ahead of the Curve. Give them a call today at... Scott, welcome to the show. Well, how you doing? I'm well, I'm well. Thank you for asking. And, and yourself? I'm doing really good. I'm doing good, good. morning so far. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, so I, it's always a good morning when you can talk some baseball too. So we'll we'll definitely be doing quite a bit of that today. But Scott, tell us a little bit about. So you went from I think it was three wins to thirty wins, and I may be off on my math a little bit. I'm a I'm a social studies teacher, but like you took over a program that had been you know I I nothing against the previous staff or the kids or anything like that, but they hadn't had a ton of success on the field. And then you were able to get the ball rolling in a very short period of time. So I would like to know, you know, what did, what were some of the things that you felt like led to some momentum moving in that direction or just some different things you did whenever you started? Because you've got this vision for the program when you take the job and, and I'm sure that, you know, it's a step-by-step process, but I would just love to hear, you know, what, what did the vision look like for you? What were some things that you did with your first steps and then how did you get them to believe that they could accomplish the things that they were able to accomplish this year? Well, to start out, um, I know that we needed more ball players. Uh, I think just because the university or the college had started uh, and it was so fresh and they had two COVID seasons. So they didn't really have a whole lot built up into it compared to the other programs. Um, so maybe some of the not just the local kids, but anybody that thought maybe they could just dust off their dad's, you know, glove out of the garage and just start playing college baseball. It was maybe that kind of an atmosphere. So you can only do so much with the guys there. Um, and they would only practice a couple times a week. And, um, you know, maybe their facility only had one tunnel. Um, so my vision was, is to get more space to train in another facility. So I rented that out. Uh, again, Pickens, where I, my full-time job is uh, work and give lessons to Pickens Baseball Academy. So, you know, we're softballs and baseball players, anywhere from 7U to, to, uh, to the pros. So I had, I wanted to get that involved. So I rented that space out and then, uh, you know, we needed more recruits. So I contacted most of the people that I could, that I knew. And, and uh, you know, with junior college, you get to work the player out for a couple hours. So, you know, where other colleges, you, you're not, not allowed to, you know, for NAI and JUCO, you can, you can train the player for a couple hours. So given an individual lesson to a player that is excited to possibly see what's the difference of other colleges, that's where I think that's where it really started to help because that's where I meshed with the players, but they knew what I was going to give them here and what kind of personality we were together. Um, so uh the that helped as far as the player development part because I personally trained them before they got here uh or at least showed them what we had in a camp setting or the two hours that we get and then uh our strength and conditioning coordinator we needed one of those so I called my friend Dana Cavalia I was with the Detroit Tigers for eight years as a bullpen catcher okay. and I got a chance to meet quite a few people uh and Dana was with the Yankees at the time and he was there for nine years as an MLB strength coach of the year the last time they won the World Series so I called him up and asked if he could help out. Now, he can't be a remote site, but he's a push button app away for our guys that has nutrition, sleep habits, hydration, and then the actual workout. Uh, and he can plan that out for them and they can consult with him and he'll do a few Zooms, and, but he'll be around if, if need be. So uh, we got a strength and coordinator and then I thought we needed a video coordinator. So uh, one of my friends, uh, Jake Martin, he uh, is a fent- fentanyl in Michigan. He'll stop up as many times as he can, but he works for the Colorado Rockies last year was in AAA and this year he's in AA and uh, he uh, helps uh, our guys do their player profiles through video, helps them break it down and then kind of gives them some advice as well. So we, we have a little bit more of a staff than, than maybe what they had before. Uh, they sure. went through three, four, three or four coaches within three or four years. Uh, but uh, I think they were four and 22 uh, last year 
and we took over. And yeah, this year we were 31 and 18. Uh, so basically after we get a chance to give the player an opportunity to take care of his routine while he's on campus, that, that I think we got a chance to show that more than what maybe some of the other coaches did in the past because they weren't just going to go rent out a facility, you know, for twenty five or thirty thousand dollars to make sure that the college team that pays them, you know, eight grand to, you know, mm-hmm. to, to make sure that that happened. So I think that helped just because it was part of my job that I had a chance to have that opening for them in Mount Pleasant with it being such a new uh, new college. But, you know, we, we practice at a high school field and we play at a high school field and they're still nice fields, but, you know, they're on their way to getting a new field. So that that's also just going to be another thing that we can add to the recruiting tools um, that we kind of upgraded. So the, the players kind of trust a little bit more uh, opportunity for themselves. And then once we hit the fall, um, you know, every single day I like to watch games. So we'll have our skill set session where three o'clock to four o'clock is optional work. Uh, four o'clock to uh, five o'clock, we'll do the team stretch and uh, hip mobility and arm bands and throwing and, and then maybe like 20 minutes of individual skills. And then we'll do five o'clock to seven thirty is live game. So if I bring in 20 to 25 pitchers and they all want to throw two, a minimum of two innings a week, then, you know, we're looking at 40 to 50, 60 innings right there. Mm -hmm. If, you know, so we need to play 10 innings a day. So everybody's getting three to four at bats. Everybody knows the dugout routine of how to get on and off the field, to pick up the guy out on the field, to sit and watch. We have guys in the stands while they're waiting their turn to get into the field to play. So we have quite a bit of guys on campus, you know, 60, 70 guys, which I really like, but, they all buy into making it, you know, the routine that they need. So when I get a chance to, you know, either get a pickup recruit because I get a call from a guy that I trust or I get to, you know, work them out myself. It's uh, I think that was maybe one of the changes too, where some of these other kids, they just showed up on campus and the coach kind of had what he had. Sure. Um, so those are kind of a lot of changes, but uh, so far it's so good. And uh, mm-hmm. I can't wait for it to start up again. We're going to go August 10th. Uh, I love that. And I I love hearing that, you know, one of the first things that you thought they needed was the strength and conditioning coordinator. And you also mentioned nutrition, sleep habits, hydration, workouts. Uh, Did you just feel like that, you know, you're, you're actually coaching the entire athlete rather than just coaching the baseball side. And that had a huge effect on the success that you guys had. Yes, I do. Um, You know, a full routine is what you're going to need. If you're going to do it, you got off the field stuff that is always going to grab your attention from girlfriends to, uh, to roommates, to, uh, you know, uh, grades and, and, and family members passing and, you know, just a lot of adversity off the field. So we try to make on the field as positive, as, as carefree as we can. We, pl- we blast the radio. We welcome uh, jokes, you know, even if they're disgusting, you know, it's just on purpose to make sure that everybody's laughing to, because if you laugh, then you break out some more, endorphins that are going to make your muscles relax so you can fire you know more often and it also is entertaining so your mind doesn't lose focus as much because we're always trying to be kind of goofy but at the same mm-hmm. time uh, there's responsibility to what you have to do and so we take it serious but then if there's a little downtime let's make it the most entertaining downtime that we can so i think there's a lot of years i spent with the tigers and uh and with independent baseball for three years just uh you know there's a lot of downtime so you have to mm-hmm. There's always the class clown. So I welcome everybody's class clown out of themselves to, to see <laughs> if they can, you know, brighten somebody else's mood and keep sure. it going. Cause then all that off the field stuff takes care of it when you get on the field. And, and so you're not allowed to bring a bad attitude. So I like to go seven days a week. I don't mandatorily make anybody go anytime. Mm-hmm. You know, if they're, if you're not there for a couple of days, I'll probably be like, Hey, what's going on? Do you not like this or not? But if they have stuff going on, like for grades or for their, uh, uh, you know, fit, they need a trip back home to see their family or something's going on that, you know, I just, I told them to just let me know they need a day off and, sure. and I'll take it. And, uh, and so it's pretty lighthearted. I like to have the personality stay themselves. And then there's the team personality that'll, that'll hold them accountable uh, to make sure that they don't, you know, they're not gloating too much and they're not being mm-hmm. too much of a, a, a sour, sour puss for the day to be drawing attention to themselves. Let's just keep it sure. all pretty even. So, Yep. So far, so good. I love that. And, you know, I, I, I love hearing that you're, you're coaching the total athlete. I think that that's something that if it's not already in, in our coaches toolboxes, then I think that it, that may be the next wave of things of, okay, we, not that we figured out the baseball side, but we know that all of those other things also affect the baseball player. And, you know, you, 
you have set very high standards for yourself. You know, you, you came in and you did lots of different things that were different and you, you relayed that message to the players, which I'm sure that they, they were so excited about, but tell us a little bit about, you know, you, you mentioned uh, some different personality traits that you enjoy and you want to get them laughing. So the next question is, do you have standards that you guys go by as a program or, you know, some people go with rules or just, you know, what are your guidelines or your boundaries that you set? And then how do you enforce those? Well, it kind of goes off the idea. If you're having a bad day, don't bring it to the park. Um, but at the same time, if you need help off the field, then we'll get you some tutors or we'll, you know, get you some of the, you know, if you bring in 50, 60 guys, there's going to be 35, 40 guys that are over a three, five GPA. You know, there's going to be a few te- four point O's in there. So we can always help out that way. Um, as far as holding them accountable, um, you know, I'm a big guy on, on learning from my friend Dana, who taught me how, uh, like this, there's seven different layers of myofascial tissue and the way that your head travels around your own belly button because it's the center of your gravity, then that's going to determine your balance. So if you were standing, like for instance, if you were standing up and you just kind of look down to see if your shoes were tied, you'll actually feel your weight kind of go towards your toes. And so then if you were to like maybe look at yourself in the mirror straight on, then you'll kind of feel the weight in your middle of your feet. And if you're going to kind of lean backwards just a little and kind of hip thrust forward just a slight, just until your hip bones are in front of your shoulders and your head's behind your belly button, then you'll feel your weight kind of sink into your heels. And the more you're in your heels, the more your kinetic chain is going to fire in your spinal column. And you're all going to be locked in to be the best athlete you can kind of in the weight room. They don't let you hinge backwards with your butt and they don't want you to lean over because if you lean over, then you get towards your toes and then everything starts to crumble because you become weaker immediately and you got weight on your back and the strength coach might get fired if he doesn't correct your form because you're about to get injured as an athlete underneath his watch. So it gets very technical. Then and every strength coach says, you have to be in your heels. You have to be in this position for the best form. You don't see a lot of strength coaches fighting that idea. They're all, they're saying that the heel side is going to be the stronger. So I, I perform the task of making my players understand how their balance works because of the way their body works. And so okay. another fact is stereopsis is the way that your brain takes on information from front to back timing. That's called depth perception. So the more your ears are flat, the your head's level, then the more, the, the, the more of an athlete I think you could be off your instincts because your front to back timing, that's how your brain registers it. It's called stereopsis. So if you tilt your ear, and you tilt your head and you start turning it, kind of like a little kid flying around the airplane. You know, he's got his arms out. He's going around the room. And he's going left and to his right. You can kind of see everything turned together, you know, stays together. So as soon as your head turns, then you become, it's harder to be an athlete from front to back timing. So we try to tell them in positions of head and belly button relationship to try to keep a flat head during throws and fielding and hitting. So it's just something as simple as that, no different than the weight room coach telling you this is the best position. Now they understand that when they feel it. So mm-hmm. we have a conversation off of body parts. Body parts entertain the idea for feeling, which they are the only ones that are allowed to do it. Like you can't feel my earpieces in my ear, you know, for my for this conversation. You know, I can only feel it. You know what it's like to feel it, but you can't feel it for me. So if I can teach you how to feel your own task of doing it better in a more balanced position than when you came in with, then there's the player coach relationship that we just built. So as long as you understand how to do that, then I can watch you explain to others how it works. Then I know that you're teaching others and you're a good teammate. Now you have something to be able to teach others around you. Then the team cool. becomes better. And I'm the only coach every, their day, today, every single day. So if I can teach the players to teach themselves, then, and then they, they don't, you know, they come in with a good attitude and I don't get in their way, but I can remind them how their balance positions work for them to be stronger then they're the ones that will buy into it. So really I try to coach as much as I can so that I don't have to coach again. And so when I leave the park, knowing that all this stuff has to happen, I'll go home and be like, Billy needs this. Tommy needs that. You know, I'll, and then all of a sudden one day I'll just drive home and be like, can't wait to practice tomorrow. Sure. wonder what music we're going to listen to. I wonder who's going to take charge. I wonder if anybody's going to deal with any adversity. Like we'll just beat it when it heads. But I didn't give one sign all season, not one steal. Not, we don't wear an earpiece. We don't wear wristbands. The catchers call their own sides. We don't tell players how to, or like when, when or where to shift, when to bunt, when to hit and run. There's no secret. I'll just stand there the whole time. And there's no reason to coach it. That did it in practice. They did it to themselves. If you're hinging out, your head's leaning towards the plate, then when you rotate your body and your hips, that'll be the same ear level angle as your head. 
So let's say you were to lean over towards your toes to see if they were tied. Then you were to look to the pitcher, act like the pitcher was like the throw to you. You'd have a little bit of lead towards your toes. And when you would rotate towards it, your, your, let's say your right-handed hitter, your right ear will be a little lower than your left ear. And so that's the same as the bat angle. So how, what's this hot and cold zones? Well, <laughs> you can see it. Stick your bat out with that head angle and feel a comfortable swing. And then the other areas are harder for you to get to. So the more tilt in the head, the more lean towards the plate or the more lean towards the catcher, then that means it's going to create the head angle. So we know that that person's more of a rotational hitter than a linear hitter, so we'll probably play them, if you split the field in half, we'll probably play them more to pull side and weak, weak opposite. And then, and then if they're standing taller in their stances, that's when they're in their kinetic chain, their heel side, and they're stronger but they also are allowed to be more linear before they're rotational. So let's make them, let's make sure we play that guy more up the middle. And he's also allowed to stand pitches longer for multiple speeds because he's standing taller in his stance and has less of a hinge in his backside. So the angle of the head, the belly button, is the angle that the position player or the, the hitter is going to present. If they hit it in front of their front foot, the barrel will be up in front of the handle. And it'll also have a little tilt underneath. So when you lean towards the plate and then you rotate, your legs want to stay usually the same height. And you don't usually travel through the ball when you hit it. You spin around it. So if you lock your front leg and you lean backwards towards the catcher, you're obviously not allowed to lower your back leg. So now you have your legs the same height again. And so you're going to be a rotational spot hitter. And by the time your bat reaches your front foot, it's a, or your hands reach your front foot, your angle of your bat is your bat is in front of your handle with a little bit of tilt. So if you're catching a guy and he follows it off straight back and hits you in the masks, he probably caught it more out front than he did out in the back. Because if he hit it towards the back, he would start following it off down the line. And the more of a bloop it has, then the more deeper he caught it. And the more he angled his head was. And if he hits the cotton candy up at five, cotton candy vendor up at 512, it's like, boo! That is because he's leaning backwards and he is definitely, you know, spinning. And it's deep in the zone. Otherwise, you can't get that angle. So, as a catcher, maybe you would mix up the speeds of the pitches if he followed it off and hit you right in the face mask because you're playing with danger because he's trying to catch it in the fastest spot. He actually caught up to the speed of the fastest spot where the bat goes, or is it out front? So if you're hitting it out front and you're following it straight back, then he just changes his angle a little bit, then he might do some damage. But at the same time, if the hitter doesn't change his stance, then he's going to keep presenting the same angle. So if you're spinning in one spot, it's because you're leaning before you hit. And if you lean before you hit, your hands have to go first. If you're standing tall and you're in your heels, that makes you more linear and your legs will feel like bending and continue to bend. Kind of like what Adrian Beltre will like land on the ground with his knee, you know, and he'll go all the way down. Or like when Juan Soto takes a pitch and he still has bend in his legs and he's still moving in the same line of direction as if he wants to swing. And the more linear hitters don't even have shifts on them. You get like Joey Gallo up there and I'm not picking on him. They just, they talk about how they shift like a ton on him. Well, it's like because he only presents his angle in one spot. And so if the pitchers can make their pitches in the spots, maybe he waits for him to miss and then he does what he can do. But it, but compared to like a LeMahieu, they don't have a shift. They just play on like all straight up the middle most of the time because he hits it in all spots hard. So the guys that are standing more linear, like real tall in their stances, like uh, Raphael Devers, he's at his heel, even though he has an open stance. You can see his back is straight up and down. And his, if you were to line the back of his heel, the back of his butt, and the back of his head up, while he's in his stance, then you'll see that he's he's uh he's in his kinetic chain. Whereas in like somebody that leans has an open stance but then leans towards the plate, they can see their butt hinge out. Uh, then you know that they're going to close down and have more weight towards their toes. And if they have weight towards their toes and they're falling towards the plate when they swing, then they're not going to stay on multiple speeds as much. So you know how to call a game based on the guy that stands and the way he drifts and the way the balance creates the power and you shut the power off if you're off balance, but you do create only certain angles of weak opposite deep in the zone with an angled bat. That isn't going to be, you know, why are all of your outfielders in the same depth? If the guy's a rotational hitter, you would think the opposite outfielder would be weak. If he's weak opposite with an angle and it's going to kind of boom right over the first baseman, then why wouldn't you play the line and, and, and towards the first baseman and in when it's going to blue, they're not going to move forward when they hit it. They're going to spin when they hit it. And if the ball tracks deep in the zone, and then they try to hit it that's just going to boop. So then you might as well continue with that speed. But then if you throw something that, that will speed his bat up so he catches it out front, you throw a slower one, then he's going to hit a pull, hard pull. Well, if he catches a hard pull, you should have your whole left side of the field, if he's a right-handed hitter, to the to the left side of the field. 
you don't let anything down the line. Your shortstop's in the hole. You can might as well have your second baseman playing right over second base because nothing to the right side is going to go hard. First baseman comes off the line because you can't hit it down the line because you have an angled bat, because you have a tw- tilted head, and because your head's tilted, so is your barrel. So you just tell these guys how it works, and they position themselves, and you sit back and you watch it. You just you don't need a spray chart. You don't need to pull something out of your back pocket. We got, you know, we. I'm not, I wouldn't even call out who it is. That these teams now use these earpieces. We played against a team that had a 23-year-old catcher who been there for four years, two years of COVID. And he's looking at the dugout to get the thing from the coach, to look at his wristband, to call out a, a number, to touch his own gear, to then give a sign with his hands to decide if the pitcher feels like throwing that. It's like, what you guys do in practice, man? Like, what is going on? Why are you guys, like, giving so many signs? Why don't you teach people how to read the game? It's right there in front of them. There's only so many stances. If your feet are wider than your shoulders and you rotate your feet and your hips, your head will kick backwards to the catcher. If you teach them, some people teach locking the front leg out. You do that, your head will go backwards as soon as you lock out. Any heel spin backwards with the back foot makes the head spin. So if you get someone to dive towards the plate with a hinge, their foot's going to rotate after their hand hands go first. You don't feel like using your leg first. You usually feel like using your hand first. The taller the stance, he feels like using his leg first and not his hands first. So you just tell the hitters how it works in like 10 to 15 minutes off a tee and the angles of the bat that they're creating. And by, you know, maybe like a week later, you can hear someone hitting off the tee and then and then all of a sudden they hit the tee and then they don't. They clean house on it very next swing. I know without even watching that they spun the first time and they fixed it the second time. That player knows how to make his adjustments. What do I need to say about it? So then you teach them how the glove works and, and when they release it as a pitcher and how to throw a baseball. How to throw a baseball is just how to throw it. You just call it a pitcher because he changes some grips, maybe, and he makes it move differently. But you don't have a left fielding, you don't have a left field throwing coach and a center field throwing coach. So you, you don't have a, you don't have a pitching coach. Well, what's the deal? It's just how to throw a ball in the same position every time you release it, so it's accurate. If you change the grip as an outfielder to a curveball, you'd still try to chuck it. In a, you know what I mean? So the idea is just teach them how the body works based on where they separate their hands. Mm-hmm. And then that creates where the ball is going to be in the zone for them to hit. So if you teach them what body parts to move to hit the high pitches, and then you teach them what body parts to use how to move to hit the low pitches, then it's pretty it's pretty simple that you can cut off your zones because the pitcher is vulnerable to what their rhythm is, and their rhythm is right there in front of you. He's going to separate his hands high. He's going to swim around his chest a little. He might pull it back into his uh, armpit or he's going to uh, pull it off to the side. And as soon as it gets to the side of the body, it starts pulling that ear. And once that ear starts to tilt, that arm starts to drag and get into that airplane sl- slot. So the head angle creates the arm angle, and the, the glove to the target, the head follows the glove. So if you're in a position to make your glove swim around your target, then guess what your head's going to do when you release the ball? It's going to be tilted. Then your arm's going to go around across the line of direction. No different than a catcher needs to know that with his outfielders throwing it in because they've got to hit a cutoff man, and he has to line up that cutoff man. And if that outfielder always spins off his throws, that's going to make his arm drag, and he's going to be way off target. So you have to line up the guy for that guy's miss. So now all of a sudden you're a pitcher, and you got a catcher back there that knows what your your commands are, or your mechanics are with your hands high or your hands low. If your hands are lower, then your thumbs will go down when you break out of your glove, and that creates your body to stay into a non-rotational position before it goes down into the – because your head's behind your belly button towards, like, the center fielder. Uh, and then all of a sudden when you land, your head will get on the other side of your belly button, which puts you into the rotational position. So if you go backwards first into a non-rotational, like a tennis server, then they'll go straight forward. They won't be rotating on the way there because they're in a non-rotational position. Like if people lean backwards to the catcher and then try to rotate, they'll feel their front oblique get pulled. And I did that my senior year of college for five and a half weeks. I was out, tried coming back after three. I just wanted to play so bad. And uh, uh, But if I had known that if my head would have been in front of my belly button towards the pitcher's side, then it doesn't activate that oblique. So if I teach somebody to bend their knees as they swing – that forces the head to stay in front of the body, no different than an infielder doing a backhand, pushing off their back leg into their front leg, having their knees bent to get the scoop and then continue through it to make the exchange to throw to first. Their bend, their knees are bending the whole time, sending the glove through the ground, you know, through the area where the ball is going to skip through the ground. And their glove just keeps moving because their legs keep moving. So the idea is that if you keep your legs keep moving and your glove keeps moving, then you'd be fine. But people teach hitting by having their legs spin or stop or lock and then their bat doesn't continue moving. 
So with the pitching side, um, you know, if your hands low separator, they have a better chance of getting their head to come back on their uh, their front side. Uh, when they rotate, their head will go past their glove. And that hand causes your hand to pronate. If your hand gets causes to pronate, then that'll make the ball start to sink. So if a guy blocks his chest from a hand size separator with his glove, by the time he releases it, your hand is flat. So don't look for sink on sinkers or change ups. They're going to be straight. He'll throw a straight fastball and he'll throw, he'll throw a straight change. Because they can't get their hand to pronate because their glove's blocking their chest. Their head can't get past their glove. Or if the glove spins off to the side by the time they release it, their head's not past it. But their head is turned, which turns your hand on the ball, and you can't get on top of it to throw off speed pitches. So now you don't have a lot of tunneling with your pitchers. But if you have you know, command with your glove staying in line, then your head will stay in line. But most people that swim or they charge down the mound too fast with their head and glove separating at the same time towards their target, it just sends them into a rotational position too early, and then they spin normally in their minds. But it's, it is pulling themselves off, dragging their arm. They have to guess across the zone. So it's really tough to be consistent. But you you will miss up no, or, no. or you know, yank stuff out of the zone into the ground. So if you just look middle up and you see it out of his hand being spiked, you'll spit on that so fast. But if you know what body position to feel your weight go forward off your backside to keep your head flat on pitches middle up instead of angling it out, it's kind of like when they tell you to bunt. You ever see anybody tilt their head to bunt? Hmm. They turn around and they got their head flat, their ears are flat, and their back's flat. And then as soon as they tip the, they lean towards the plate and their head gets lower, you know, angled, and they tilt the bat when they go to push it out to contact. And then everybody's like, keep the bat flat, keep the bat flat. And so now the kid keeps his bat flat, and everybody else does. They keep their head flat, the bat flat, and they bunt the ball, and they're successful. Then they allow him to go into the hitting, and they go, lock your leg, or get a hinge, or open the close. Or... And then they got all this head tilt with their bat going through the, side, the zone sideways. And then you got tunneling with pitchers where the ball goes towards their feet and away from their feet, and you got the barrel below the handle. Like, duh. Like, what are we doing here? We're so oxymoron for what we're teaching. Like, if you want the, ball, the bat flat – to cover all speed pitches in any position, then why would you have them have a moving bat with momentum going towards the plate or towards the catcher or staying in one spot and twisting? So if you just teach them the body angles and they see the facts right there in front of them and they can feel it themselves, what do you want me to say? It's all cleaned up in about six or seven weeks. So I don't care if you send me stats. I don't care if you send me a video. I don't do anything about that. I just need you to understand that we're going to have this kind of conversation and I'm going to watch you feel the difference and you're going to smile and you feel the difference only because you're in a better balanced position. If you come into camp and you're already in every single one of these positions, then I'll, I'm waiting to see it. Mm-hmm. But no now doubt. that they understand how they do it themselves, then I think that's why we took off. And you know, I'm not bragging that I didn't give a sign. I'm like, I just didn't have anything to say because the players would already shift when they do, you know, what they were doing. You know, like we played, we played a team and, we have a rotational right. He sometimes he leads over the plate and he tries not to, but he likes to have his bat over his shoulder, which kind of makes him go towards the plate when he lifts his leg because your knee will lift and your chest will dive towards your knee a little bit. And so he was a pull guy. And they had shifted everybody to the right side of the field. And he's a left handed hitter. Or sorry, he's a right handed hitter. And they moved all their infield to the right side of the field and left left side wide open with a, with a third baseman like playing short. And when, all my guys were laughing and he hits a, his hands cast around and he hits it right on the handle and he pulls it down third baseline like eight hopper. And by the time the guy gets close to it, he's already safe. And uh, he gets up again, and <laughs> they do it again. They move all the way over. They didn't do it to, for anybody, but they were shifting in the wrong way. And then he pulls one, like, you know, whatever, way into the deep left field uh, foul territory over a shed and hits a car or something. And the coach is like, all right, everybody move back. It's like, well, why'd you move in the first place? And they wear wristbands, and they get all their signs from the dugout. And I'm like, they're not even shifting them correctly. I had 30 guys in the dugout snickering because they're like, <laughs> why are they shifted? If anything, he this guy errors that side hard. So why would you guys be shifting? They, my guys couldn't understand why their coach was calling that, but he, the players on their team just follow their robot coach. So, like, I don't know. I think it's fun to, to play chess and checkers, but really most of my guys, as long as they stay with the nutrition and the hydration and the sleep habits, then that's when your muscles recover. The more you can recover, the more you get reps you get because you don't get as tired. And your body recovers. So get nutrition, your hydration, and rest really, really good because that's the deepest sleep is the deepest re- is the best recovery. So don't be screwing around. Like it doesn't mean I get it. You guys like your shows and you like video games, but just find you know do it in the daytime or something in between classes or or something else. But don't be staying up doing it. Just go to bed. It's for your muscles. Then tomorrow you'll be even sharper and recover faster and get more out of you. 
So we like to play like 50 games in the fall. Mm-hmm. And everybody gets over 100 at bats. If I see something on the field that needs help, I'll just tell them tomorrow in early work. Hey, let's let's go to let's, let's just clean that up in early work. You got a weird lead off at first, or you don't know how to read lefties, so let's go over the moves, or maybe the lefty doesn't know how to do a pickoff move, so we'll incorporate that. So I think I was fortunate to be with the Detroit Tigers and uh, other people, just meeting coaches and just being part of the game for a while um, and trying to take it all in from a strength coach's perspective. You really can't screw it up if you're only giving them advice on their own feeling of balance, and you're not talking about stuff that's that's they have to think about or no they visualize and they don't understand how to feel it them, themselves. So some coaches maybe, you know, will teach to feel other coaches. Maybe will teach the motivation, I guess. It sounds beautiful. Maybe they don't, maybe they don't coach at all. They just recruit and sure. see what they got and just sure. read them out as they go. But I like doing the individual lesson part of it. So I guess uh, the only way to come to bed is if you like that part, but once I'm done talking to you, you don't have to, you know, I'm not going to bother. They're not going to bother you at all. You just need the facility, and you just need mm-hmm. you need your teammates to be there to to do some drills. And we we have guys coming in knowing they're going to be here for three years because they want that player development for one year. You know, if you think about it, the school's three thousand two hundred eighty eight dollars for a full year. I mean, that's like summer ball cost. You had a few hotel tournaments. Well, there's your apartment fee. You know, it's only three hundred twenty bucks for an apartment for ten months. So it's kind of it's kind of cheap. So I'm kind of in a good spot because it's not hard to recruit. But you don't have to really give a lot of scholarships out. Uh, but you, we do give them out. We have 24 scholarships and we have 24,000 to give out. Uh, so we help out a little bit. But for the most part, anybody that usually plays with a travel ball team, you know, those expenses are about the same. And you get an education plus 50 games in the fall. They play a 56 game schedule in the spring. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't think there's anywhere that you can go for that kind of cost. No but doubt. I, I don't know. I'm no really excited about it though. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's fairly evident listening to you, you know, how, how excited you get when, uh, when asking you about that. Uh, so let's, you know, you, you talk about all the games this fall, putting a lot of, of, of ownership with the players, which, you know, obviously, or I, I, well, the listeners know that I'm, I'm all in on that any way, way that we could do that, but let's, let's fast forward to the in season portion. So you set, you know, you set the standards, and you talk about how you want the fall to go. You guys play a ton of games. You bring them in for early work. You, you do a ton of one-on-one stuff. But let's get to like January. How are you preparing them you know, to, uh, for game one? And a, a lot of the stuff that you just mentioned that you do in the fall, I'm sure will translate directly to preparing them uh, for the spring. But uh, enter- entertain me with the question, uh, you know, how, do you get, how do you get guys ready for game one starting when they come back in January? We have uh, 35 yards of turf in our facility, and there's like, I don't know, maybe a 28-foot high ceiling. It's all netted from the top to the bottom. Uh, so our guys will be able to use that, um, I think, five days of the week, five days of the week, um, which to as much as they can. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, we, we left at like, I think, March 4th. Uh, we went down and started in Myrtle Beach. So we only get about seven or eight weeks once they get back. Um, you know, we have indoor mounds and we throw off of those. We throw live to each other a lot. Um, we have a couple tunnels that are 70, 70 foot, foot uh, cages. And uh, we have a hit tracks and we have cameras. So we log stuff and we review on our TVs that are usually playing live games. But uh, we have the MLB network. So we'll we'll flip that on and try to get some kind of, you know, past games to go. And while the game's going on, we'll pause it and we'll start talking about how to, how would you call this game? Where would you stand on the outfield? You know, where would you, you know, when would you pick over? And so we'll probably get more into the team stuff. We like to play wiffle ball too, because there's a live ball in the air for base running. Um, it's not the, it's not the, the biggest building for it, but at the same time, you know, you get a swing, you get a reaction. Guys are, you know, engaged coming on and off the field and, you know, just little things like that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh-uh-uh. We give them, you know, I don't know who comes in out of shape, but we don't, we don't, we try to, we don't try to get them up to too high of a pitch count um, early. But I know for our spring trip, we had 13 games in seven days, uh, so we we brought extra pitchers. We asked we asked a few position players to actually prepare for it, just in case we we really needed it. But fortunate enough, our guys. Came into spring training ready. We played Oldie Central the very first game. They're Division One JUCO. They're they're good. I mean, they were in the regional finals against Wabash this year, um, and uh, for Division One JUCO, uh, 
and uh, we faced them, and they were 16 games in, and we were, were just off the bus, hadn't been outside yet, and uh, one of our recruits from Texas, about 155 pounds, five foot nine, maybe ten, uh, and he threw 41 cutters, 17 changeups, and seven four seam fastballs, and we beat him five to two, and he throws like 78 to 82. And so awesome. we're like, really? Like, let's go. This is the way this is going to go. <laughs> like, all right. So, uh, you know, we had some other guys that we, we knew were a little more polished, but we, we knew that he, he was he was the right guy for the spot. But we had some older guys that had been there for three or four years that we told him we were just going to pitch him the very next day. So, uh, you know, we started there. We had a really good spring. We ended up beating uh, some good teams. Uh, came back with a, you know, I think, I think more wins than the team had their very first year. They they went seven and twenty three. The next year they went six and two. And then COVID went four and twenty two, and we were coming home like seven or eight wins, um, maybe nine. Uh, so we get into our first league play, and it's Grand Rapids, and they are they are usually I mean they're like they've had five cha- five national championships. I think they've won the league multiple times, and so like here we go. Let's see what we got. We beat them six to four the first game, and then the next game we are uh, nobody on, two outs. The guy's throwing a one hitter against us, and uh, we end up we end up winning that game two to one. <laughs> we had no runs, one hit, nobody on, two outs in the last inning with the last batter up, and we get a bean ball, and then we get uh, a, a lefty to slap it to the third base side. There's a bang bang play at first. We got the call. First and second, we get a we get a wild pitch, gets to second and third, nine hole hitter gets an inside sinker, pulls it through the hole, game over just like that. And we we're like, wow, now we're two and zero. Oh. So bus ride was fun, kind of got some stuff rolling. Next day we take uh, one out of two, and uh, in extras, and we're like, wow, we're three out of four with one of the toughest teams in the division. Um, so we got that rolling, and uh, that was I don't know the momentum just continued from there. They believed and. They kept doing it. We played a couple uh, four-year schools that were top 25 ranked in the country preseason, and we split with both of them, Northwood and Davenport. Uh, and then, and it wasn't their exact full team because they, you know, they have like a JV game, but you'll see some starters in there and some guys that were part of their stuff. So we, we felt like that was a good matchup too because they're pretty good. Um, and then the conference was, you know, it's got some weaker ends to it. We split. But, you know, they were still good games, and our guys were still learning. And then they became, like, middle of the pack of the conference. And we finished out uh, having a chance at the very end against Kellogg. If we were to take three out of four, then we would have won the conference. And so, you know, just to be in that position at the end was kind of nice. And But uh, midseason, we played Lansing. They're, I think, preseason fifth in the country. Kellogg was preseason two in the country. And uh, we ended up getting mercy by – uh, Lansing, the very first game in the midweek game that we played them on a Tuesday. And then uh, we came back like 20 minutes later, started another game, and we were up 8 to nothing in the first inning against an upper 80s lefty. And we, we turned the Jets on, and the kid that won the first game against Olney, the little guy throwing the cutters and the changeups, he takes down Lansing. They get like, you know, just a few hits, like one run. And uh, we mercyed down the second game. So we and then, and then Lansing went to the World Series. So, you know, we beat Kellogg once and we took him into extras in another game uh, out of the six games that we played him. So that was encouraging. So we're like, you know, with 12 one run losses the year before, when we were four and 22, 12 one run losses. So we just got over the hump by putting a little more time, getting a few more recruits, and then, you know, seeing, seeing some more guys change. Now the recruiting is getting fun because people understand that we got something going, but. The idea was before that we didn't we didn't have a lot of recruits that were recruited by other people, and you know one to mention is Aiden Arbogast. He, he had a really good season. Um, actually, throughout the season, we had I think there's like nine weeks of voting. They do a pitcher of the week and a position player of the week, and they started doing the pitcher and the position player of the week like three weeks into it. They had both awards, but for the first couple of weeks, it was just a hitter. Uh, we won eight, eight or nine eight or nine different players on our team won that award. Different players. And then Aiden Arbogast, who is player of the year, freshman of the year, first team all-conference, first team all-region, first team all-American, the only all-American out of Michigan 
as a position player. Um, he wasn't recruited by anybody just besides us. Uh, and he becomes like one of the best players in Michigan. And so it was really cool to watch him develop. But um, and then we had some well, other players that, that, yes, yeah. So it's like nobody else bet on this kid. He's 6'5", 172. We, get, we commit him here and give him a uh, scholarship and he stays with him. He's coming back too. And we, we got Purdue and other people offering him, not offering, but starting to talk to him and Division ones and twos and all sorts of people, which is really, really cool because everybody always asks the question, Coach, how can you get me out of mid when you guys haven't won? And it's like, well, it's not what mid does here. It's what you do when you're here because that's the phone call we're making. You know, just because we win doesn't mean we everybody leaves. You know, we give the kids a goof that doesn't really do his job and this, that, and the other, then that's what we're going to report. Yeah, he's usually late. He's got bad grades. Well, that's what you showed me. But if you're like a really good teammate and you do all your stuff and you take care of your stuff, then that's what I'm going to report to the next guy because we can't lose our credibility. All we can do is say what it is that you did in front of us. So there's the relationship that we have with the guys, and you do it for me, we'll do it for you, and we teach at the same time. But that was cool because they won those awards, and then that was like, you know, how are they doing all that with all those guys you know, we had a player transfer from St. Clair Shores. Yeah, SC4, I think they call it. Uh, he had like a 1.0, uh, 6'2", 215 pounds, throws like 92 from the outfield. Uh, hit a home run against us in the fall when we scrimmaged him, but he didn't play in the spring, probably because of the grades. Uh, he calls me like two weeks before we start last year, and he's like, Coach, I was wondering if I could get a spot on the team. I, you know, this is this, this. I was like, all right, well, yeah, well, let's go. We'll, we'll fix you up. 3.2 GPA, first team all-conference, first team all region and he's coming back. So we have everybody but six guys coming back. And the guys that we dished out was a kid to Davidson for Ivy league school. He's a, a pitcher. And then we have a pitcher going to McKendry university in Illinois pitcher going to Howard Payne in Texas, a uh, left fielder going to Saginaw Valley state university, the division two school in Michigan. And then a guy going to the USPBL, which is an independent league in Michigan for, you know, uh, like a, like a pro ball type stuff. Mm -hmm. So everybody kind of went somewhere, but we're getting everybody to come back. Plus our recruits coming in. And so I'm really excited about that part because, and then we're moving into a new conference, which has two teams that are almost new. So, uh, well, Alpena community college is brand new. And then Bay County is trying to develop their program. Um, so it'll be, you know, Muskegon and, and Grand Rapids are coming with us. So we're going to be, uh, with Delta as well. So there'll be six teams there. And then Kellogg and Lansing are going to be in the same division. So it's going to spread out a little bit differently next year with three different divisions, but it's fun with all the kids that we have coming in. We have kids from, I think we have six Dominicans, two Venezuelan. We had a kid last year in Israel, from Israel. We have a kid from uh, Italy. Uh, we have a kid from Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, I think 12 from Texas, one from Florida, one from Kansas, one from Ohio, one from California so far. And it's only been a year four or five. So oh, I love that. That's really neat. Yeah. So with one one question that that uh, that keeps you know you you keep uh, talking about player ownership, and getting them to own that part. Like uh, what for for the coaches listening that are shaking their heads and they're like, yeah, like I want to do more of this. I want to give our players more ownership. What are some just conversation starters or things that you do to really promote that? Besides, you know, I. It sounds to me like you you do a lot of asking questions. You do a lot of, hey, what would you think? Uh, things like that. But for the coaches out there that are like, I want to have more of these conversations, what advice would you give them? Want to have more que uh Well, I guess teach the body parts because it ends up being their feeling. And if you can make, make sense that the feeling that you're creating actually is what they feel, sometimes the coaches will demonstrate and they think that they're doing the motion that they're doing in their head versus what the vision is. And they might not understand from a strength and conditioning standpoint the most balanced position is going to be the strongest position, which is also going to create the most power. So if a kid's form is off and you correct the form, then you create the conversation over the feeling. And so once that created, it creates them to understand what feeling they can correct themselves, then they can make their own adjustments. And then they usually only come to you if they don't know how to do it yet. But once you show them how to feel it, then they usually don't come back and say anything. So if we get a bunch of players to teach themselves how to do it, then they can teach each other then the conversations kind of go go south because you know that they can feel it. That's why the, you just hand the ball to this kid because you know he's got his, you know, he doesn't he doesn't lose during adversity. He doesn't give up when he gets a double hit off of him. Like that could be the reasons why he gives him the ball with confidence because he never loses his cool and he keeps a straight face. But like, you know, does the kid know how to make his own adjustments? You know, that would be only a conversation that I would need. 
Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. You said something about how to get the coaches to have more conversations with their kid to have more freedom with it. Uh, I guess. Just like uh, conversation starters, like how to get, because inevitably you're, you know, once you set this standard in this relationship with them, they're going to be more open with you. But if someone was trying to establish with a new relationship with maybe, you know, they're coming in with a new group of kids this fall and they're wanting to, yeah, sure. to, to well, try and implement more of this stuff. Some coaches like to guess, they'll be like, Hey, you know, you're, you're aiming it. Like how, the, you know, you're not me. You don't know that part. You don't know that instinct to me just because my arm was dragging doesn't mean I was aiming it. You know, they might not know that their arm was dragging though. Or if they say, hey, just take a deep breath. And it's like, well, it's not like I was holding it, you know, like, and so there's a lot of comments out there that are directed towards the person's personality that really aren't happening or that maybe aren't in flow of, of how to fix something. So I guess, I guess asking how you felt, you know, what'd you feel in that one? Sure. You know, even if they do a good one, you know, because if you ask them when they do a good one and they do a bad one and you ask them how they feel, you know, if they feel a good one, I'll be like, hey, what'd you feel? They might give you a response. But then if they feel a bad one, you say, hey, what did you what did you feel? They Hopefully they'll say, I did this instead of doing what I just said. But if the kid smokes it and you're like, hey, what would you what'd you do? What did you feel? He's like, I, I don't know. I just tried hitting it. Well, then he's probably not going to know his adjustments. So now you started a conversation based on how did you feel? What did you feel? What way is it that I know that I can pick apart some conversation in your head that you use your these code words to make yourself feel like you're hitting? And if he relates that to a feeling, then that's great. And if that's the most efficient way to feel based on how your muscles work, then he's probably got it. And he has his own adjustments. Go to the next kid. You know, go find out what he thinks during his mistakes or during his makes, you know. And then I would I would start with that. That's the easiest part is just to try to gather information from what they say that they feel. Mm -hmm. But if the kid's just like, I don't know, well, then there's probably room, you know, for – conversation if you know or he'll take on conversation because he's bringing it up that he doesn't know Mm -hmm. where most people try to own it it's like oh i'm doing this i must be doing that they peacock the situation like all right we'll probably have to wait for that kid to fail more before he says coach you see anything you know after everybody else is doing it so um yeah i I don't know i guess that's what i got for that sure no that's that's some good uh, actionable practical advice well, I've got a, a couple quick hitters uh, before we we wrap this thing up, and and I'll let you off the hook and get get back to you know doing doing your thing. But uh, the first one is uh, let me find them here. Actually, is what's a drill that your players love that we can steal from you? Well, I know that on my YouTube channel, there's uh, a drill with six. It's called six different drills for T work. Okay, it gets you to cover the whole zone. And, and it explains how to get to each spot. It's on it's on Pickens Baseball Academy. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's six, six T drills to help with hitting. I think that's what it's called. Um, that that might be some of the stuff because it gets you in all the hitting positions. So, um, I mean, just to really explain the drill over the phone would be, would be kind of tough. Uh, we usually try to hold our position in a lot of our – or swing. So like, we'll take like a knee up to knee up approach where your back leg comes off the ground. You swing and hit the ball with your back leg facing it, but then you stay on your front leg and you don't move. So it's like knee up to knee up. So that means your back foot will never spin if it's trying to get off the ground. So like on high pitches, if you can get your back leg to move forward then it covers the top half of the zone, then we'll also put, uh, there's on there. On, well, I guess there's this one, six balls out. Try that one. Six balls out drill. The only way to hit six baseballs off the plate, off the corner of the plate. So, the hitter comes up, he lines his front foot up with the, with the side of the plate, meaning like he's one shoe length away from the plate. And then uh, you make the tee have a ball on top of it, six baseballs away from the top outside corner of the plate. And you're standing, you know, obviously on, the, you know, in reference to the plate, you'd be on the back little corner uh, with your foot to start. And then you'd be one shoe length away. And then as that ball keeps moving away, from you, the more you lean towards it, the less you cover. And it's really weird because the more you stay in your lane, meaning like if you stand in your stance and then you look to your left, you know, if you just stand up in the box and you look to your left, like that's, that's, that's directly towards the pitcher. So if you bend both of your knees going forward, then you'll like, I call it like a split squat position in the weight room. You grab two weights and they're on the side of you 
in each hand, you have one hand on each weight, and you have your feet spaced apart in a scissor action, and you, you put your knee down, and then you pick your knee back up. So, like, if you were in a hitting stance and you were to lower your back leg, and you would be moving forward. So, as your knee will lower, your, your leg will point from where it's at, from when you start, and then your leg will start to spin towards the pitcher because your leg will eventually – your knee and your shin will face the ground to get into a, a bent knee position, but your head stays flat when you lower your leg. So the lower you get your leg, the the flatter your head stays. So if you get six balls out and you have a hitter that has like a lot of hinge or a lot of leaning going on, no chance they hit that ball up the middle with the very end of the sweet spot of the barrel. I didn't say the end of the bat. End of the bat means – because everybody can reach six balls out if you're one shoe length away. It doesn't matter if you're six years old or 30 or you're big or small. It doesn't matter. So that's a full plate length if you think of it. Like if you take a plate and then just flop it over, that's six baseballs, the whole length of the plate. So you can hit a full plate length outside to hit the ball still up the middle. But if you lean towards it or you lean away from it, if your head goes towards the plate or your head goes towards the belly or the catcher – in relationship to your belly button, then your barrel will whiff by the time that it reaches your front foot. It'll go to the left. So it really teaches your head to stay in front. It teaches people to bend their legs to hit. And then they'll notice that their head's flat and you can reach further from your body the lower you get. So if you lower your back leg towards the front of the plate, towards your front leg, and you have bend in your legs, that brings your backside, your backside brings the barrel through. Whichever way your back leg faces, that's where the ball or that's where the barrel of the bat's going to go. If you stay in one spot and twist your foot really quick and spin it all the way around in a circle, then your barrel will spend time just traveling in a circle. You'll just spin everywhere that any contact point that you have, you'll just be spinning. Whereas if you were to lower your leg, you go linear first, and then your knee goes down and you get into like bed leg positions and uh, that keeps your head straighter. And it gives you more reach. And you can also hit, like Dustin Pedroia would almost get his knee on the ground and hit an up and in fastball over the green monster. You know, but and you see his head's flat. You know, but his knee's almost on the ground. So you can hit the high mm-hmm. pitch, the middle pitch, and also the low pitch, the lower your legs are. But you can also reach further away from your body off the plate the more you stay in your own lane. So the taller the hitters stay in their lane longer with a flatter head. That's why they cover cover more 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 uh, area of the plate. So if you can practice six balls out and still have the ability in your stance to hit that ball up the middle, the further you're in your lane, the easier it is to hit the ball. The lower your leg is and pointing towards the ball when you hit it with your back leg, then the easier it is to hit it. So as you work away from the plate, some people like visually they see a ball high, so they start to stand up to hit it. That's not going to work either. Your barrel's underneath your handle. They see a ball get deep on them towards the catcher side. They try to play catch up. They quickly lead backwards. Well, sometimes they see a ball floating away from them or on the outside corner. And somebody tells them to look for it that way. Look for the ball away. They'll start to lead. And the more you lead, the less time your barrel spends on the ball through the ball when you decide to rotate to hit it. So we practice a six balls out drill on the tee. And uh, after we do the leg off the ground drill with a high pitch. So we do knee up to knee up. Then we go knee up to knee down, and then we start taking the one pitch away or one ball length away from the outside corner until we get to six balls out, and then we can still hit that pitch up the middle so we can feel range of motion of our swing. doesn't mean that we're always going to try to double that one off the wall, but if the guy throws something and it's off the plate by an inch and you come back to the dugout saying the umpire screwed you by an inch off the plate, like, dude, you can hit six baseballs, a full plate length, 17 inches, away from the spot that you think that he screwed you on. So you will, now we don't have players come back saying that the umpire screwed with them because we know how to get our body into a position that covers a whole big zone, usually bigger than what the umpire has, not saying that the umpire today screwed me. So we just practice leg off the ground so that we don't rotate our back foot. We also practice trying to see how far we can hit a ball away from us by staying in our own lane going forward mm-hmm. so they can trust those contact points. So maybe a guy's nasty and he starts a slider right on the corner and it always finishes three or four balls off the plate or he starts mm-hmm. it on the plate then it still finishes two balls off the plate because it's covered four or five balls while it's you know breaking its plate uh we want to be able to commit to that having our back leg still face the opposite direction to keep our barrel dragging behind our hands and then if we lower our leg it'll keep our head flat which keeps the barrel flat and it won't allow us to spin so as we lower our leg will point to that side 
and hit it. So I guess that'd be a drill. Sure. That I would say to try. No doubt. And I'll, uh, I'll, I just put in the show notes to link your YouTube channel. So I'll, I'll make sure I put that below. All right. Final question for you. What is the latest thing that you've learned that you feel like you've has made you better at your job? Does it matter if it's recent or a long time ago? No, go ahead. I'd love to hear. I, uh, I didn't know that there would be an absolute because there's so many different people teaching it. You know, you put a golf club in a barber shop. Now you got like 17 golf pros, right? But you didn't really, nobody came out and said, well, yeah, but the strength coach said that uh, this is the way your muscles are formed. And this is the only way that you're going to react. And I'm like, wait a minute, if that's a fact, then there's an absolute to this game. There's an absolute in the weight room and I all agree on it. But if you're not in your heel side, when you're catching, then you're going to bounce your glove because your chest is leaning forward. If you keep your chest up, like a first baseman catches it, if he's leaning over, he'll catch it and he'll jerk the glove around. But if your chest is up and you know how to keep your spinal calm into that kinetic chain, then you do know how to be a better athlete. It doesn't matter what sport you is. So like that was a game changer for me because now I'm instead of just, I went to school to be an elementary teacher at CMU. And so, uh, you know, I, I didn't end up doing that because baseball kept going. And now I get to teach baseball. So that's my classroom. Uh, and it's like, you know, if you just teach these kids that there is absolutes and I don't teach them to force it, they feel it. Then they smile. And I'm like, see, you didn't feel as much effort to do it, but yet you got more out of it. If I don't know it in college, my back knee goes down. That forces my head to stay in front of my torso. And then I wouldn't have pulled my obliques. So I'm like, well, why didn't my division one school and division one strength coach and all – Nobody told me. Nobody's telling the big leaguers when they lean back, they're going to blow their obliques. But like Yelich and Judge and some of those guys, like there's a lot of guys. Anytime that they pull, any pitcher or hitter that have ever pulled their obliques, it's always their front side. That's the only, So think about it. You reach down and you scratch the side of your right leg while you're standing, and then you, and your right leg with your right hand, try to twist to the left. You can't. Now keep your right hand on your right leg. Now try to twist to the right. You're, you know, you can twist a lot. But then now let's lean to our left side and try to scratch the side of our left leg and twist to the right. You can't. But then twist to your left. You can. So there's a rotational side and a non-rotational side. So if you talk about healthy positions for your arm and you separate low, your arm will be in the L position for less. And you won't blow out your UCL or your uh, your uh, rotator. But if you are a hand size separator and you block your chest, now you've stopped your momentum going forward. Three muscles speed it up, two slow it down. Now you got like one slowing it down and you don't have any deceleration with your hips or your leg or your hamstring while your front side goes towards it. So you block your chest while you throw forward, you blow out your labrum. So you know what injuries to stay away from. You know how to teach people uh, so that they don't feel it. And we had a kid that used to swim and uh, he would have a bad elbow pain when he's done with his bullpens. I just put his hands lower below his belly button and then his, his hand pronates. And I'm not trying to Tommy top or totem pole or name drop, but like Brock Porter came in. And he's, he's going to be a really good draft pick this year. And he's for Archer Lake St. Mary's, the number one team in the uh, country for uh, high school baseball. And uh, he was a hands-high separator with a twist up by his ears. Uh, he twists his leg in and stuff. And so some of the stuff wasn't as consistent. So all I did is told him to keep his hands near his belly button and then, you know, stay there until you feel like throwing. And, like, his changeup got better, his velocity, his his line of direction. And then he, now he might be the number one pitcher taken in the draft. But it's, it's like it worked for him, and all she did is just give him one little tiny thing. But that gave him better balance, and it gave him better direction so he could pronate his hand more. They talk about his changeup being the best pitch that he has, even though he throw, he topped out at 101 in high school ball. You know, So it's like it's very interesting to, uh, to continue to help everybody in that standard. But th- and it was a game changer for sure. Mm-hmm. When you get into the argument at the barbershop, if someone were to say, yeah, but physically, go ask a strength coach is this the way your muscles are made? And is that the best motion for them to get the most efficiency for each athlete in front of you? Now that is something that would drown the crowd of all their dumb ideas by creating hinges or getting somebody to put a PVC pipe on their back and they lean over and then they got to, they, then they have to turn their head. You know, there's like, there's just a lot of different, you know, there's just a lot of different ways to, to put yourself in an unbalanced position compared to the balance. And if you're going to stay in that position, then you're giving away what you're allowed to do. Hand size separators and swimmers, they're going to leave the ball middle up. Guys, their hands low and go right to the target with their glove and they lead backwards away from the separation. They're going to throw it low. So we're going to practice getting our leg low. And we're going to practice getting our back leg off the ground because there's only two types of pitchers. If you separate your hands right in the middle, then that has a chance to go right down the middle. So whoever he separates his hands, that's going to cause high, low or middle. So it's like, just watch the game. 
and watch what the muscles do, watch what everybody else feels, and that would be a game changer because now there's absolutes to your program. You don't need wristbands. Everybody can see the guy's leaning over. He's going to be hard pull or weak opposite. That guy's going to leave the ball up. So if this guy's leaning over the plate with a right-handed pitcher who's got a hand size separation with a twist, and this guy's got like an open to closed, leaning over the plate hinge, he's probably going to beat him. <laughs> it's going to be up and in for a fastball. It's going to be low and away in a curveball. If the guys that lean towards the plate, if they, they get a curveball in the dirt with two strikes, they have to honor the fastball out front. So they have to use their hands first, though. Once the hands commit, the legs commit second, and they're leaning. So they have to go for stuff in the dirt. Guys that lock their leg and lean backwards, they have to go for stuff in the air that goes away from their face, cutters and sliders. Mm -hmm. So the absolutes of the way the muscles work through a strength coach's perspective, I don't think there's enough people that say, uh, you know, I'm not trying to rip on anybody here, but, like, why doesn't the strength coach talk to the hitting coach? Well, it's because the hitting coach doesn't need to hear anything from the strength coach teaches hitters anything. He's the hitting coach. It's not like he walks into your weight room and tells everybody how to lift because he knows that it's not his spot, too. But you don't get together and find out, is this going to injure this guy? Is this the best position for this guy to be in? And then they say it. But then they allow all these different positions, and everybody needs to be what they want to be and let everybody do their own thing. It works for everybody. Let them have their own way. Well, if it, if it is their own way, and then, that, but they're not as balanced as they should be, then that means I just show them the other way, and then they get to have their choice. So my guys can be whatever they want, but they eventually feel it, but they don't ask a lot of questions because they know how to fix it themselves. So the easiest way to get the kids to learn it themselves, they need to learn how to move. They need to learn why their body moves the way that it does and how to be in the strongest positions when they activate their instinct. And then and they just teach them how to do it. So that's that's what I do. I don't know what everybody else does, but that's that's what I've gathered over the years. The easiest part is, is facts about what they feel. They, they look at you like, what else do you see? Because they know you know what they feel because you're just watching them and you know what that feels like. So coaches don't teach to feel. They don't understand the difference to the strongest positions. You might be telling a kid to be in a position that's not as strongest. Or don't do that. And we're the high school coach or summer coach or coaches argue, and you're going to do it my way. And then they're in a position that feels less. They're going to lose. The coach lost that kid because he feels it less. But you're over there like, yeah, just like that. And he just like rolled over, dubbed it, you know, didn't go very well. Or they're after the fact coaches are like, let it travel. Hey, hit it out front. It's always after the fact. Tell them where the ball is going to be where to look for it. This is the feeling that you need to do to do it. And then they just teach it that way. That's, that's going to seem so much easier. No doubt. Well, Scott, I appreciate your time and I'm going to have to go through and listen to this one again to, uh, to make sure I soak all of this stuff up. But uh, contact information for you is below. If, if anyone wants to get in touch with you and, and I know that, that you would be, you know, more than willing to, to share like you have been with me. And, and I, I, I so appreciate that. But I did want to leave uh, on this note. Is there anything else that you uh, w- that we didn't cover that you want to express to our listeners before you go? Um, no, I mean you guys can reach me at uh, I mean I have a Twitter page. Uh, at Pick, it's called at Pickin Baseball. There's no S. It was already taken. Pickin's baseball is taken. So we got P I C K E N Baseball. Um, you can DM me there or email me or you know whatever. Uh, I do individual lessons and help out all the time. So if you're in the area or if you feel like making the drive or if you want you know, consultation over the phone or if you just want to find about a mid or um, if you need kind of in, some kind of instruction, just, just you know, let me know. I'd be able to help. Thank you so much for listening to Ahead of the Curve. If you would do us a huge favor, leave a rating or review wherever you are listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone and tag us on social media. That would help us so much with growing the show and helping others to stay ahead of the curve.